I'm Amanda Olke. I'm Adult Education Director here at the International Spy Museum. And I am delighted to welcome you to Ancient Espionage, the Greeks in the Great Game. We have a really amazing partner for this program, the Hellenic Society. So I would like to give Art Demopoulos a chance to say a quick few words, thank or you. a long few words. No, no, no. Just really, thank you for having us here. Thank you for being here on this uh, fascinating subject. Um, our society was uh, developed or established to preserve uh, Greek heritage in America. And a lot of what we want to preserve, I mean, to touch upon your subject, which is so, so fascinating, was um, uh, so, so many of the things from the ancient, ancient world have devolved and that we live today, our, our system of government, from entertainment, science, and what have you. And I think intelligence in the ancient world was so important. And we've all saw the movie 300, you know, against insurmountable odds. Um, people had to use their heads and brains to do what? To preserve our freedoms. And I think a vibrant intelligence community today, especially today, we all saw that the, the, another heinous uh, act of, of terrorism last week. And if, it was, if it's not for our intelligence, you know, uh, with, where will we be? It would be even, even worse today. And I think that's why in the ancient world, they practiced, you know, they, uh, and the, our author today will go into a lot of, uh, I, I'm supposing you're going to go into a lot of it in your wonderful book that I had a chance to read. But they, they practice these things so that to preserve our freedoms, to keep us free. It was General Hayden, I think, at one of your lunches that was talking about, you know, the importance of, of all our spy agencies and our, you know, our, our intelligence community was to keep us free and not panicking and worrying all night as they do day and night. So I'm so pleased to be here. Um, we're looking to extend our relationship with the Spy Museum. They're doing some fabulous things. Has everybody seen the new building? If you go by on, the, on uh, 395, you can see it. It's going to be fabulous. So exciting. And thank you for being our great partners. Oh, it's, Thanks. It's, Thanks. Really, it's really our pleasure. We have, we have a little tiny Trojan horse in Spy One, but we have more illustrious ideas for the Trojan horse in Spy Two, as we call our, our new museum, which will open maybe late next year, maybe a little after that. It's my pleasure to introduce Ro Colonel Rosemary Sheldon, who I think this is her third time that she has spoken here. Um, she has really taught me a lot about the ancient world. She's written seven books, uh, Spies of the Bible, Operation Messiah, that's a real eye-opener. Uh, was Jesus a Roman provocateur? Uh, questions you may not want to explore, or you may want to. Um, today we're focusing on ambush, surprise attack, in Ancient Greek Warfare, which is her latest book from 2012. She is the, she's a professor at Virginia Military Institute in Lexington and is the Bergwin Chair of Military History there. She's taught there since 2000. And 1993. It, 1993, I read her CV wrong, my bad. All right, well, she is a terrific speaker. You will enjoy this. She'll have time for lots of questions. And we also have several of her books for sale and signing after the talk. Thank you. It's always fun to uh, come back and talk at the Spy Museum because after all, where else would an intelligence historian want to speak? <laughs> and, uh, and an honor to be uh, sponsored also by the Hellenic Society because I, I love speaking about the Greeks. Uh, they're always there, they're always there first, and they always do it very well, and then we, we hopefully learn from them. Um, sometimes it's hard to write intelligence history about the Greeks uh, because we, we, we do lack the sources. Um, obviously, the, the bigger polis like Athens and Sparta uh, are written about, um, but not in the detail that, that we would like. And since uh, Athens especially was a democracy, we think of it as people who don't spy on each other, that everything was open, it was all done in the agora, and why would you need spies? But the fact of the matter is, you always need spies. You always need intelligence. You always need to know what your enemy is doing. And it's never more important than it is, obviously, in warfare. You never have to explain to a general why he needs intelligence, because nobody's going to fight a war with his head in the paper bag, you know, not knowing what the other side is doing. 
And I wanted to zero in on one uh, specific aspect of uh, warfare, and uh, that is ambush, because not only were the Greeks good at it, but historians have denied that they do it. So my job tonight is to prove to you that yes, they did, and uh, as always, they were they were good at it. A lot of uh, has been written in the last 20 years about Greek hoplites, uh, the 300 Spartans, of course, at Thermopylae, that the uh, phalanx was made up of heavily armed soldiers who all had these large shields that protected the person next to them, and so you had to stand in line closely and march forward with your spears. Two heavily armed phalanxes would press against each other and the one that broke first and ran lost and you would gain the territory that had the, the wheat in it. You basically fought in valleys. It did not depend upon uh, timing. You know, you both knew you were in the valley waiting to set up. It didn't depend on surprise. You both knew they were there. It depended upon force. So, you know, the, the Greeks, they just don't have to sneak up on anybody. And, and to show you that I don't make up the, the things that other historians have said, you can see here, the essence of savage warfare is treachery and ambush. Primitive military tactics consist of stratagem and surprise and attack. That, that savages do this, but civilized people don't do that. Um, the military classic by Ardon Tupique says, war between savage tribes, between Arabs, <laughs> uh, even today, is a war of ambush by small groups of men which each one at the moment of surprise chooses not his adversary, but his victim and is an assassin. All of these words are loaded with values about culture. The deer slayer, James Fenimore Cooper, talks about how you know, Indians uh, love to sneak up on you from behind trees or, or kill women and children. The fact that one generation before, it was the Americans who were hiding behind the trees, uh, killing the British, Somehow they've, they've forgotten, but it's, you know, the enemy does this, we don't. Charles Oman says, at least once the spirit of the Greek hoplite compared close to that of the Franks, um, and right to win by ambush, night attacks and surprises seem despicable to the Frankish mind. So now we have this, this Western idea that it, whether it's Crusaders or Franks or any, the, the Western people don't do that, the Eastern people do. And to show you, it's not just a 19th century, early 20th century phenomenon. Here's a book by John Poole in 2004. Since the Crusades, Westerners have noticed how differently those who live east of Constantinople fight. Eastern adversaries routinely avoid set-piece battles. John Keegan, one of the, the most uh, lauded military historians at Oriental Warfare, right there, Different and apart from European warfare is relying on evasion, delay, and indirectness. Uh, w. Kendrick Pritchett wrote a five volume set on the Greek state in war um, and claims that the ancients, both Greeks and Romans, were far removed from such malpractices as plotting mischief against their friends with the purpose of aggrandizing their own power, and that they would not even consent to get the better of their enemies by fraud. And finally, Victor Davis Hanson um, describes non-hoplite soldiers as guerrilla and loosely organized irregular forces, the neo-terrorists who for centuries have been despised by Western governments and identified with ill-equipped landless poor. Okay, he says, in all of us there is a repugnance, is there not, he assumes we're right there with him, hating the other side, for hit and run tactics for skirmishers and ambush. This is a burdensome legacy of the West, that battle under any other guise except head-to-head -head confrontations is unpalatable. He not only says that the West, we don't do it, and we hate doing it, but the reason we don't do it is because we inherited this Greek distaste for it. He's gonna blame the Greeks uh, for the fact that we just can't get the idea of fighting irregular warfare. So, I say, well, if you're going to blame the Greeks for something, let's go back and see what the Greeks wrote. Let's see what the Greeks said about themselves. So if you comb Greek literature, you have to start with the Iliad, world's greatest war poem. Iliad 1, first book, Achilles accuses Agamemnon of having the heart of a deer and says, never have you dared to go into an ambush with the chief men of the Achaeans because that way lies death. In other words, you've got to have cojones to, to go into an ambush. That's where you're going to show your bravery, you know, 
mano a mano, eye to eye, never mind you know, a big uh, group of people surrounded by their friends. There's a long speech by Itamenes, I will not read it to you by the Cretans, he says, for now all the best of us were being chosen beside the ships for an ambush in which the valor of men is best discerned. So when, when the Greeks talk about ambush, they talk about something that's serious, it's important, it's done by the premier fighters in the Iliad, and that they admire people who do it because they're brave. Paris, however, gets bad press because Paris isn't a frontline fighter, he's an archer. And so he hides behind columns and other people and, and shoots, and that's considered kind of sneaking up on people. He's, of course, a lover, not a fighter. You know that? <laughs> um, but Paris also, uh, as we'll show, that, that uh, very often bowmen will fight on the side of, of hoplites, too. That it's, not, it's not an either-or thing between them. And, of course, they're attacking uh, uh, Paris because of his not being there. He's with Helen instead of with them. Now, book 10 of the Iliad, the entire Dolonea, as it is called, is a spy story. It's a story of a, of a Trojan spy named Dolon who thinks he's going to go out and spy on the Greeks, steal their armor, kill Achilles or who, you know, wh whoever he finds, and, and can come back and be a great hero and he's going to be rewarded. Unfortunately, on the way, in the night along the path, he comes across Odysseus who's doing the same thing from the Greek side. Okay? And they interrogate him. They scare the living daylights out of him. They find out where he's going and what he's doing. They get him to give the installation of the Trojans where everybody's sleeping. They kill him. They leave his stuff hanging from a tree. They go to the Trojan camp. They slit people's throats in their sleeping bags, or whatever the Greeks slept in in those days. And they stole horses, came back, picked up Dolan's stuff along the way came back to their camp, took a bath, had a glass of wine, and it was considered a masterful coup that they killed more people in that operation than maybe a whole division of soldiers could have done if they had attacked them in the daytime. And you see no shame attached to it whatsoever. And this is the wily one, that, that yes, you have Achilles, the brave soldier who does everything frontally, but you also have Odysseus uh, who does everything in a sneaky sort of way, and they're both Greek, and they're both heroes. So the Greeks recognize that you have to have both. Here you see the, uh, the famous Polyphemus vase. Even in the Odyssey, where you don't have set-piece battles at all, um, you have people sneaking up on people. You have um, Odysseus blinding the, uh, the Cyclops by sneaking up on him um, and then escaping by going underneath the sheep so they can't, when the blind Polyphemus tries to feel for him, he feels the sheep, but he doesn't know that the Greeks are underneath them. So the entire uh, uh, book is filled with sneaky tricks. If we look at even the history of hoplite warfare, it is not monolithic. Um, I happen to believe that uh, it's something that developed in the Archaic Age and was full-blown in the 5th century, that there were, there were not hoplites in the Iliad. Um, and the reason is because when you look at vases in the Archaic period, what do you see? Um, men running, men ducking down. You see um, men interspersed with bowmen. You see a bowman on the, on the left up there. Um, that bowmen are hiding behind hoplites and firing at the enemy. They're not terribly close together. Here you see even from the 8th century, bowmen, archers, slingers, that the groups had a mass of, of various kinds of fighters. It wasn't just the heavily armed hoplite. And who would better know what the Greeks fought like than the Greeks themselves when they're drawing pictures of themselves on their own vases? Here you see an archer taking um, cover behind a hoplite soldier, even in their sculpture. This is from the famous temple of Aphia at Aegina. There is still debate among scholars over how close together did the hoplite phalanx fight? Were they shield upon shield? Some people think that they, there was a, a six-foot gap. Um, so 
within the idea that, that Greek historians will argue with each other, um, what I did was I went through all of Greek literature to find out that if the Greeks didn't do this sort of sneaking up thing, how many examples could I find? And I came up with 77 examples of night attack. And if you're being a nice guy, you don't sneak up on people at night. 17 examples of dawn attack, 52 ambushes, 11 examples of people at sea, okay, uh, escaping at night, and uh, assault landings, five. So for people who, who didn't do this, there are certainly a lot of examples out there of them doing it, okay? Thucydides in the Peloponnesian Wars gives us an example of a, a night attack um, using the Greek verb expinaios all of a sudden by surprise to describe how the Thebans had entered the city of Plataea at night, both surprised and frightened the Plataeans, and it was caused by the fact that they didn't know they were coming, and they suddenly found their city occupied. Herodotus has the Phocians who took their uh, hoplites and uh, covered them with chalk, gypsum, okay, and then you invade at night. You, c you can see your own soldiers, and you know they're gonna be disguised. The other side thinks they're ghosts and gets scared, living daylights out, like, you know, who are they? And in that moment when you hesitate, they come upon you. At Sphacteria, um, it's a small cigar-shaped island on the uh, western side of Greece. The uh, Athenians land and have a secret attack in the morning on a group of Spartan hoplites, and they capture 120 fully armed Spartan hoplites by surprise. You don't capture Spartan hoplites on a battlefield, but you can sneak up on them and capture them. And it was important because, first of all, in a, in a small phalanx, 120 people is a lot. Secondly, it's going to be the bargaining chip they're going to use to get the peace of Nicias, which is going to happen between the two parts of the Peloponnesian War. So the minute those Athenians captured those Spartans by surprise, it was suddenly peace terms were, were being offered, or at least for a temporary truce. And here you see up at the top where, the, um, where they land and then where they capture them. The Athenians storm a at night, which is uh, uh, during the uh, Syracusan attack down in Sicily. In Amenes, night, night attacks, um, they would send people who spoke Dorian dialect in first because it sounded like the Spartans, so they could infiltrate them with people that sounded like they were allies, but they weren't and then fall upon people like, while they're still sleeping. Not fair, but, but effective. In the fifth century, when they're fighting with hoplites, yes, there are a lot of set piece battles because if you are a city state that can put out 5,000 hoplites, 5,000 citizens, you can fight that kind of battle. But other than Athens, Sparta, Corinth, Argos, who else had those kinds of numbers and that kind of money? Uh, Greece, think about it, 18% of the land is arable. That means the rest is mountains, forests. Um, there are small little city-states that uh, simply can't afford to have hoplites. So what are they gonna use? They're gonna use slings, they're gonna use bows and arrows, they're gonna use their hands, they can hit you with rocks, they can garrot you, right? They'll fight and they can be deadly, they can fall out of trees onto you but they're not gonna fight in the hoplite phalanx because they just can't afford it. And by the end of the fifth century, at the end of the Peloponnesian War, um, much of Greece is gonna find out that it can't afford to do what it once did. Too many hoplites died in the Peloponnesian Wars. That war ran from 431 to 404, 30 years fighting the war in the same place. We, we complain about Iraq now, but think about it. This was a war your grandfather could have fought in it, your father fought in it, now you're fighting in it. And there's a lot of deaths and a lot of destruction of the land that supported the families that produced hoplites. So by the fourth century, they're rethinking the way they have to fight. Prolongation of campaigns and foreign wars, they're going to be fighting overseas. They needed more training uh, for tactics of staging and ambush because it doesn't really take a lot of training for a hoplite, you stand in line, you hold your shield, you push forward with your spear. As long as you don't break the formation, you pretty much know what you have to do. But ambushing 
takes training. If you're going to triangulate and catch somebody coming through the mountain pass, um, you have to have timing. You have to have the signals to say when to do it. If you come out too early and they see you, they'll turn around and run away. You have to get them where they are. You have to know where they're going to be ahead of time. And they cannot know where you are. And then you have to move in for the kill, and you have to kill all of them. Because that way they can't fight back, and they can't go back and tell their other colleagues where, where you are. And so that kind of small arm tactics and training takes a little more time, and you will begin to see specialists. We have light arm troops called peltasts. The rise of commanders like Iphicrates of Athens, who hired mercenaries, trained these people to fight in the new tactics. There you see a, a Greek peltas. It's a much smaller shield. It's made out of wicker. They, they aren't wearing heavily armor. They're just wearing clothing, protective clothing, I hope. Not, you know, nothing special in the way of boots, but in other words, somebody who can run away. Someone who, if you get a group of them and somebody does have a hoplite phalanx, you can chase them once they break. Or if they're chasing you, you can outrun them. And so warfare takes on a completely different complexion in the fourth century. To get back to that Western thing we do, <laughs> if you look at modern handbooks, like this, the typical ranger um, handbook, and I'm sure there's an updated version that's classified that I can't get a picture of, um, you see that we've been training people for small arms combat and for you know, ambushes and for uh, guerrilla fighting for, for quite some time. And you know, yes, we're good at it. Light infantry platoon squad. Um, you, you see it in the marine handbooks. You see it in the army handbooks. We know how to fight these kind of wars. We train our soldiers to do it, and we've been doing it for quite some time. So then the question is, if you don't sneak up on people because you're sneaky genetically, because you come from one of those, those fern groups of people that you know, just doesn't fight the right way, why do people ambush? Okay. Reason number one is force multiplier. When, when you're outnumbered, when somebody else has a big force and you have a little force, you're not going to meet them head on. You're going to sneak up on them. Head them off at the pass, right? Where does that phrase come from even? Because th that's the way you can kill more of them than they can kill of you. And if they can't see you, even better. Um, a lot of this happened, um, to take it out of a Greek context, in um, uh, the Jewish wars with the Romans. That the Romans, in order to march to Jerusalem, always had to go through these very tall, rocky passes, and the things were always lined with Jews throwing rocks on the Romans. And it worked. It worked. They would, they would push their uh, heavy uh, uh, equipment over the side, uh, and then the Romans would have no siege equipment by the time they got to Jerusalem and have to give up the siege. Two, when it's the only mode of attack available. Uh, whether it's a Greek context or Roman context, since the Greeks didn't really have an empire, there wasn't a lot of occupation of other people's territory the way you have with the Romans. But the Romans, for example, they occupied Judea. They forbid the Jews to have an army. They forbid the Jews to use weapons. And what does that leave the Jews as far as options are concerned? Well, they would when they were manufacturing weapons for the Romans, they'd have one in ten, they'd make them defective, and then they'd kind of say, oh, we've got to throw this away, and they'd hide it. And then when they had a cache of weapons, they would have an uprising against the, the Romans because that's the only way you can fight them. And it seems slightly unfair to say, well, we, we've, we've taken over your country, uh, we occupy everything, we tell you what you need to do, we give you orders, and now when you rise up against this, oh my God, I can't believe how sneaky those people are. Right? Because you have no other choice but to fight that way. So, Ellen Bush is the choice of a group that must work with smaller forces and lightly armed troops if they're, if they're armed at all. Reason number three, to establish the element of surprise. Again, surprise always works. People love to talk about, oh, well, just surprise them. It's not that easy. It's a hard thing to do, especially strategic surprise. Um, after it's been done, you know, there'll be books and books and books about it and how they did it. Everybody would like to achieve surprise, but actually uh, doing it isn't that easy. So um, if you have the chance of doing it, because the terrain 
gives you that. It delays the enemy's reactions. It overloads their um, and confuses their uh, command and control. It has a psychological effect. Nobody likes being ambushed. Nobody likes being sneaked up on, stabbed in the back. You know, it's a horrible thing, but it works. Um, it doesn't take many people to do it. And, and you're kind of stuck for a minute, like, oh my god, I can't believe they ambushed us. This is what terror attacks do. Um, there are that many people killed, right? But it's horrifying that anybody is killed. You know, you're on a, a, bu a bus or train in, in uh, London going along, suddenly, boom, and it, it, it just takes the whole city breath away because of, of what's happened. These people don't expect to win in a battle. These people don't expect to even win in a war. What they want to do is to get you to stop occupying them or fighting them or make it so expensive that you know, you'll give up a war. Um, the Romans, for example, uh, had a way of fighting it, which we don't have the option. The Romans used genocide. They could go into Spain, they have some uprisings, they kill everybody there, end of problem. At the end of the First Jewish War, the Romans killed one million Jews. One million, that's a tiny, it's a tiny little place. The second uprising, they deported every Jew in the country up into Galilee and turned it into a Roman city and put up pagan temples. When you have that option, yeah, you can do it. That's, that's the way you defeat, you know, terrorism. You just, kill everybody, but we're just not in the business of nuking people. We, we don't do it that way. Uh, we, we have modern uh, newspapers, and there's the press and, and world opinion, but in the ancient world, they didn't have that, so people had options that we don't have. Reason number four, when the terrain dictates it. Well, if you are in a place that has hills, mountains, ditches, passes, broken territory, you are going to learn to fight there and to fight effectively. And people would, should think twice before they tried to invade, whether it's the Khyber Pass, you know, going from uh, uh, Afghanistan into Pakistan, or, or any kind of rough terrain. The people who live there tend to know it very well, much better than you do. And, uh, and if you go in there, they're gonna, they're gonna jump upon you. They know where to hide. Um, in the case of the Romans, when they went in the second time for the Jewish war, they simply found the holes the Jews had dug, they found the caves, they found every outlet, blocked them, threw incendiary devices in and blocked them. And then uh, 1,500 years later, we roll back the rocks and we find incinerated bones in there. But you have to be willing to, to hunt down every single one to kill them before that will be effective. Reason number five, when the opportunity presents itself. Sometimes you just see somebody come and you think, oh, this is gonna be a great ambush. We could see this happening. Um, uh, we, my husband and I visited the uh, place in the Tudorberg Forest where um, Romans were set upon. Three Roman legions were wiped out by a, a bunch of uh, German rebels. And as I walked along, I said, okay, there's a swamp here, and there's a hill there, and there's a forest covering you. And I thought, I could stage an ambush here, you know? And my husband said, I bet you they, they could have put archers, you know, standing behind the trees over there and shot. Yes, some places are made for it. And if you have one of those, use it. Reason six, an ambush can be used as a, a diversion. You don't kill everybody in the ambush. You kill a few people. But if you're ambushing somebody over here and they're not paying attention to what's happening over there, you have yourself a diversion. So you can get people's attention by doing an ambush just to get them to not pay attention to someplace else where you might be invading or attacking. Number seven, ambush is used to capture intelligence assets. Sometimes you don't kill people. Sometimes you capture them and you torture them. You find out what they know. Um, and the, the Greeks, their, Xenophon Xenophon's shows a lot of examples in that because um, Xenophon had to lead a group of Greeks out of uh, the Middle East through Turkey back to the Black Sea. So he's going over unfamiliar territory. And he has to know, is the next village, uh, are they gonna be on my side? Are they gonna poison us? Have they poisoned the wells ahead of time? Uh, are they waiting in the mountains to throw rocks on our heads? If you capture somebody that can give you that intelligence, maybe you won't walk into the next ambush. Reason number eight, it's part of a deception plan. Ambushes can be used to actively mislead the enemy 
to make them think you're after something you're not or to find out what their intelligence resources are. Uh, if they think you're ambushing to find out one thing and it turns out you're not, and the whole thing is a diversion campaign, that can be quite useful. Ambush to demoralize the enemy. I've heard this fact, factoid, I guess, until I see it in print, I won't believe it, but it says if you kill one in every 10 people that that casualty rate is enough to demoralize the enemy, that the, the higher number of people you kill, and if you do it quickly, it kind of stops the other side. So if you can have enough ambushes just to get the kill rate up, you don't have to kill everybody, you don't have to get them out, but you can bleed them dry to the point where they don't want to fight anymore. Reason 10, because your intelligence assets are better than your enemies. You have to know where the other person is to ambush them. And you have to make sure they don't know where you are. Therefore, when an ambush occurs, I don't have to ask, well, gee, did they know? Of course they knew. That's how they set up the ambush. Do you always know what their intelligence assets are? No. Do you know the name of the person who got the information? No. But you know how it happened. And therefore, even in a place where uh, you don't know the spy, you know the spy is out there doing his job because the army itself found out what it needed to know, set up the ambush, and it was successful. So the Greeks, what can we say about them? Well, they uh, both admired and used ambushes when appropriate. You know, how many examples did I have to collect to convince anybody? You know, 237, if that's not enough, I give up. <laughs> Victim of an ambush will always call their ambushes Bushers cowardly. Nobody ever says, boy, that was a damn good ambush. You know, <laughs> boy, they were smart. They just snuck on, uh, up on us and gotcha. Well, you know, good for you. No, no, it's you dirty, rotten, scoundrel, backstabbing, blankety, blankety, blank that did that to us. Um, and yet it's not cowardly. You have to wait out there alone at night, not knowing if they're going to come in the right place. You have to run down. You have to kill them with your hands. Of course, now we have guns, but in the Greek context, you had to kill them with your hands. Uh, there's nothing cowardly about that at all. And when, of course, when you do it to them, it's oh, how clever we are. Yes, we did a wonderful job. We ambushed them. We're so smart. <laughs> Ambushing is not connected to ethnicity, nationality, or character. It's situational. People do not ambush you because they're, they're sneaky. They ambush you because they can because it's effective, because it's a tactic that has been used in warfare since the beginning of warfare. And whoever uses it, it was the person who figured out the terrain was right, the situation was right, our intelligence was good, and they used it. If you want to, uh, again, prove that it has nothing to do with be being Middle Eastern, just look at any of the major battles between the Ottomans, the Safavid Persians, and the Mughal Indians. They're all set piece battles. Why? Because they had armies. And when you have armies, you meet with armies. But it's not a good idea to attack the Romans because they have 28 legions. And unless you have 28 legions, you're going to have to sneak up on them. There's no other way to do it. It's uh, Western way of war has always included ambushing where appropriate. It's not the only way you fight. If you have hoplites, fight with hoplites. But hoplites are only going to work if the other side shows up with hoplites. If you have hoplites walking along a road heading towards a battlefield and you ambush them from a forest, if you just jump out of the trees on them, yeah, you, you can kill most of them before it happens. And I'm amazed that there wasn't more of that in the fifth century. That for some reason the Greeks decided that we're gonna have two large groups of men in full view, march against each other, follow the rules, all stay in this big square and march to military you know, music and beat, and, uh, and fight this way. But, and we think it's because, again, they're fighting for agricultural land, the, the occupation of that land. It's not just, oh, there's some odd thing we will do for religious reasons. It's, it's because of what you're fighting for and that that way of fighting was appropriate. The stereotype of the Western, Western way of war, modern doctrine in the US Army, presumably a Western force, stresses not face-to-face -face mass charges as in Greek Phalanx warfare, but indirection, weak spots, and mobility. A very, the very strategies and tactics that Victor Davis Hanson characterized as inferior, non-Western. Um, and he said that, you know, basically, you know, the attack against the Greeks 
to say that they didn't do it or that we don't do it because they don't is a complete chimera. There's, there's no uh, truth to it all, and it has nothing of value for a serious military historian. And of course, the ultimate ambush, the Trojan horse, that not only did the Greeks ambush, but when they did it, they did it in a way that has become the paradigm for all ambushes. The Trojan horse that gives its name to, to you know, computer programs and every way of sneaking into someone where they don't detect you, we can refer to it in the same way that a Rosetta Stone becomes the phrase for the cracking the code of any language, the um, sneaking uh, up of the Greeks into um, the city of Troy and then jumping out of the horse worked well. Um, it doesn't even matter if it's true. It doesn't matter if it happened, if they built the horse. I often wonder, they're on a beach, where did they get all that wood from? I guess there must have been a lot of driftwood hanging around to build a horse that big. Um, but the fact of the matter is that when they write about it and they describe it, they got to the key, they got to the idea. And that's what's so great about the Greeks, is they invent the very idea. They're, they come up with the paradigm for it, and then everything after that is commentary, or trying to make it better or worse, or, or explain how they did it. But the Greeks always come first, and always do it best. So. Um, if you're interested in the, the idea of how the East gets labeled with this cowardly thing, there's a book by Patrick Porter on uh, military Orientalism, because we've been accusing our um, foreign uh, enemies of, of being sneaky forever and ever. And uh, if you want to see the other 319 examples that I left out of this talk, um, they're in my book, Ambush, uh, which I think we have some copies in the back. And with that, I would like to open it up for questions, if anybody. Yes. Wait, can you wait oh, for the uh -oh. thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I had two questions. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about this specific um, Trojan horse and using ambush in the context of a siege, okay. and if that changed anything at all? And also, which of the 10 reasons you laid out you thought were most to c come to bear on that particular ambush? Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, siege, sieging, besieging a city is, is, a, is a subset. It's a skill all in and of itself. And besides the fact that they did the Trojan horse, in the fourth century, um, a um, general of the Achaean League named, named Aeneas Tacticus wrote a handbook on how to besiege a city. Uh, and the way to do it is that you have to have someone inside the city who will open the gate. Now, you can do it the hard way. You, you can get siege equipment the way the Romans did, just, just batter the walls down. Romans were the ultimate engineering uh, warfare people. They love battering their way through walls. Greeks didn't do that. They're smart. So we haven't got 10 years to waste. Let's get a spy on the inside who can open the door. That's one way. But another way is to get in under under disguise. Now, there is, there's a ton of literature on, you know, did the war actually happen? Did it happen? What time? Was there a Trojan horse? Some people are saying that, uh, could it be that the Greeks had a, a boarding bridge, you know, a ladder with a top that looked like a horse head that went over the wall, and that people going up it and coming out the front looked like a horse spewing people? in which case that would be the typical way that you, you know, go into a city at night when nobody's looking, you scale, you scale the walls. Um, I, I would think it's, again, situational because besieging only happens two ways. An another um, very interesting Greek example from the fourth century is that you have uh, the spy inside and you have the enemy on the outside and they have to communicate. So the enemy on the outside uh, takes an arrow and he puts messages around it and he shoots it into the same tree. And then the other traitor inside, who knows that's gonna happen, comes when nobody's looking, unloads the arrow, reads it, and that's how they communicate. Unfortunately, because they didn't have standardized arrows, something went wrong, the wind blew the wrong way, the arrow goes over the wall, misses the tree, and hits an innocent bystander who dies right there, a crowd gathers around, and then they find out who the spy was because they, they got the note, Le leaving the problem of what happens when the dead drop drops dead, so. Were both sides considered pretty equal in terms of force, and were both sides considered pretty equal in that? As far as we can tell, because, yeah, I mean, there, there are no uh, uh, 
statistics on you know who was on the inside and the outside. But certainly the Trojans and the um, Greeks were, I want to say equally numbered, because there were a lot of Greeks there. But of course, Troy is, the, is everybody in the city. Uh, it's not that big a city. Um, they, weren't, they never meet group to group. It's always single fighters of heroes. Uh, and so you're, you're never going to be able to say, well, you know, uh, a phalanx thing wouldn't, wouldn't have worked. So I, 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 it's hard to pin it down because we just don't know. Okay, my second question mm -hmm. was um, you gave an example with a book of how, if we wanted to know more about how it became a misunderstood about the East um, right. only doing ambushes. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have any background about how the misapprehension about the West never doing it mm -hmm. sort of evolved? Mm -hmm. Well, I hate to do this, but I think I may have to blame the Greeks for something. I, it starts in Herodotus. It really does, uh, where, you know, we, here we are, the democracy and, and, and the West, and we fight this way, and the Persians fight another way. And, and there's some little nasty comments that he makes uh, about, the, you know, the remember it was the Greeks that invented the, the word um, uh, barbarian. They were barbaroi. They were people who didn't speak Greek. Anybody who didn't speak Greek was barbarian. So right there, you've got a cultural judgment against them. Um, uh, xenophobia, f fear of the stranger. Um, labeling people from the East as slaves because they followed a king blindly. They weren't citizens of their polity. They were simply following and fighting because they were told to. Um, whereas the Greeks were citizen soldiers fighting for, for their, own, their own land. Um, and so that, that kind of begins it. But of course, people pick up on that theme and then will expand it and use it. Uh, but I don't think they necessarily use it the way the Greeks do because you know the Greeks didn't have much of a world view. It's a tiny little place around the Aegean that they're talking about. When we have a world view, when we have maps, when we have aerial photos that we can see the land and, and, and we know what other cultures are, we can fly to them, we should know better. We should know better. To underst understanding your enemy and your enemy's culture um, it's a good way to prevent wars. It's also a way, if you're going to fight them, figuring out what they're going to do. But to stereotype and think, well, they're going to ambush or they're going to be cowardly. Yeah, and if they're not and they come back at you, you can lose because, you know, you, you just underestimated them. Yes? Perfect. Um, What's your insight into how these ambush tactics apply to the new cyber warfare? You mentioned um, Trojans and cyber sure. is kind of well, the new playground. The Greeks didn't have cyber warfare. It's, I mean, they didn't have guns. There, there, there's so many things that are so primitive about what they do. that That's why they come up with an, a simple idea, um, but then you, you can't possibly imagine what, what's going to happen in 2,000 years to make, make that uh, worse. Um, it's always about sneaking up on people. It's always about getting there first, right? Uh, it's always about blocking the other side. Um, and so tactics don't, don't change all that much. It's getting the jump on your enemy. It's not letting the enemy in your own ranks, whether it's cyber-wise or, or having a, a spy in there. One of the criticisms of, of, of my first book especially um, a, a, an historian said that, well, you know, this espionage stuff and, you know, the intelligence services, it's only the function of highly bureaucratic, paranoid governments. No, it's not. It's, it's everybody. It's everybody. We, everybody had to worry about what your enemy was doing and whether they're going to infiltrate you. And that is true today because I don't care how many spy planes you have, how many satellites you have in the sky, how many computers you have running, in human, it only takes one guy with the codes to screw up $20 billion worth of equipment. Johnny Walker proved that, right? That's the problem, is that, that you know, if, if you constantly rely on the technology to protect you uh, and you take your eye off the individual, it, it's a somebody behind a curtain, it's the guy next to you wearing the old school tie that you thought was so trustworthy, um, those are the people you have to keep your eye on because that's the Trojan horse. I was just going to comment that <laughs> Professor Eric Klein mm -hmm. from GW's mm -hmm. theory, if there was a Trojan horse, mm -hmm. is that it was a ship. It was the hull of a ship upside down, which I think is pretty fascinating. Could be. Whatever it took to climb over the wall. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. 
So one of the things that is interesting here, it seems like the ambush and some of the surprise tactics draw an inter interesting parallel to just an insurgency in general. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any examples of insurgencies in Greek or Roman time or, or how they, they dealt mm -hmm. with captured cities maybe differently than, than we well, would think about today. See, the thing about insurgency is it implies that somebody is occupying your country. And the Greeks didn't do that. The Greeks had city-states that fought against each other. They would, in, e even Alexander, he invades, he goes all the way to Afghanistan, he comes back, he drops dead. What, what is, you know, it, it's, uh, there is no one person ruling over the empire after his death. Of the three empires that they do set up, um, the Ptolemies, we probably have more information about them, um, there, there weren't many insurgencies by them, you know, by, by the Egyptians against them. They, they seem to have fairly good control over that, there are just many more examples in the Roman world because the Romans did occupy countries, turn them into provinces, and that's what you have to have the insurgency to get out of. Um, we just don't have a lot of examples of the Greeks because they didn't occupy people. They killed a lot of people. They defeated a lot of people. Uh, but they managed to, when they, when they set up their cities, to keep a balance between the Greeks who were in charge and the vast population under them. Uh, Ptolemaic uh, literature s shows a lot of religious screaming and yelling against, you know, gods, the gods are going to come back and get you and, and you're going to pay for this. You know, there's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of resentment against the people in charge, but, but not an actual insurgency. So you just, I think you have to go to just another context to find better examples. But should somebody have gotten together and had an insurgency, that's the way they would have done it. They would have had to ambush. Uh, with the effectiveness of all the ambushes that, we hear, okay. with the effectiveness of the ambushes during the, these periods of time and mm -hmm. since then, mm -hmm. why do we find that battles in Europe in the 17, 1800s, even the American Revolution, mm -hmm. Civil War, et cetera, have mm -hmm. fighters shooting at each other directly in line and line rather than more ambushes like Francis Marion and Ethan Allen and all the other people? Because I think. Uh, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, conventional force, okay, works. If, if you are a country with money, you use it. You have a military. It not only helps you to fight other countries, it helps control your own country. Somebody like Frederick the Great, you know, showed a great deal of you know, pride in being able to set up a, um, a military. And, of course, Napoleonics. My husband is, paints Napoleonic miniatures. And my, those uniforms, my God, they were gorgeous. <laughs> Um, but you lined up, and, and that was the way men proved bravery. There was, there was nothing wrong with that. Um, you, they didn't have to do this other thing because they had the conventional force. Now, if a conventional force goes up against an insurgency or, or Amazon, the conventional force wins about 95% of the time. Uh, so if you have a conventional force, you use it, and you crush those people. You don't go to ambush first. You go to ambush last, or you use it if that's, that's all you have. But if you have a conventional force, you use it because that's, that's really quite good. Uh, since the Vietnam War, uh, there was a great deal of literature about uh, um, insurgencies and guerrilla warfare and, ooh, they had such success. We never lost a battle in Vietnam. Even the Tet Offensive, it rose up, we put it down, that was it. We walked out, okay? We'd been willing to stay and kill a few more million people. That would have been the end of it. It was a political decision to do that. It's not because, ooh, guerrilla warfare is so effective. It's that you have to be able to stay there a very long time to, to crush it. Uh, and not to use an American example, the same thing with the, the French in, in Algiers, in, in Algeria. I mean, it's ugly, ugly fighting and hunting people out, if you've seen the movie The Battle of Algiers, you know, killing traitors. Uh, but in the end, it was a political decision to move, and it was such an unpopular decision that people tried to, army officers tried to kill de Gaulle for making the decision. But if you can go with conventional warfare, more, yeah, do it. But most people can't afford that, you know. If, there's a difference between being a country and being a stateless group of terrorists. That's, that's why ISIS has to work that way. They don't have a country. They have part of Iraq, they have a little bit of Syria, because nobody's mining the store up there and they can operate out of that. But if they had their own country, then th maybe they'd have their own army. But they don't, so they have terrorists. That's how it works. And remember, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. So it all depends on you know who you're defending. Any other questions? If not, I'd be happy to answer 
questions um, uh, informally. But Rosemary will you. be in the, the back of the room and signing books. And thank you so much. Really fabulous. <laughs>